marriage matters and marriage matters. We're going to talk about some marriage matters because marriage really does matter. And if you wanted a subtitle for today's message, it could be titled Sex in the Kingdom of God. Because there are some fundamental facts about what God intends for marriage and for sex, which is going to be revealed in some of Paul's words to us in 1 Corinthians. When I was growing up, maybe some of you experienced this as well. There were many methods used in teaching, some of which included the cautionary tale method of instruction. Now, I heard from friends of mine who took driver's training classes that they used a lot of cautionary tales about driving. I didn't go to driver's training because my father taught me the old fashioned way. And uh, he held on to that little strap up to his right and uh, prayed a lot. And he got me through driver's training, just he and I. <laughs> But many of my friends in high school took driver's training and they said that they would show those awful movies with the carnage and the aftermath of accidents that were caused by either kids paying too much attention to their jokes with each other and becoming inattentive or distracted or perhaps becoming inebriated. They got too drunk and so they drove into an oak tree and they showed bodies lying outside the car and mayhem, it was awful or perhaps because they were trying to play mini golf in a moving car at 70 miles an hour. And I didn't even have to take driver's training. And I got the moral of the story. Don't try to play mini golf inside a moving vehicle at 70 miles an hour. In church, we also grew up with people who were rather passionate about using the cautionary tale method, especially when it came to that three letter word that starts with an S and ends with an X. Some of you weighed in on that. Thanks for playing this week. I appreciate that. But we're really talking about sex. We're not talking about sax, as in saxophone. We're not talking about the White Sox baseball team. We're not even talking about Lost Sox. We're not talking about the new musical Six either, although I looked it up because one person who I think may be from England put that on there on our Facebook page, and it looks intriguing to me. It's about the six wives of King Henry VIII. And they're, in, they're singing pop songs, because it's a musical, of course, and they're singing about which one of them think, thinks that they uh, got the worse treatment from Henry than all the others. And apparently, there's a competition going on because the one who got the worst treatment gets to be the leader of the band. Okay, interesting concept. But Paul's counsel in 1 Corinthians about sex and marriage is actually visionary. And when we start to unpack this and see the vision behind God's design, it becomes a beautiful thing. Rather than only focusing on the cautionary tale side of that fence, I think both are useful. And in my own experience throughout the years, I've recognized that we need a balance. We need to know that there are consequences. So we need the cautionary tales. For stepping outside of God's boundaries for marriage, there, there will be consequences. And we start to see some of them fleshed out as Paul starts to tell us a little bit more about that in detail. But we also need to see the, the beauty of his design, because with that positive side leading us into something else, we realize, oh, there's a purpose for all this. Let me give you an example. My daughter, Callie, whom you just saw in our announcements, thank you very much, great job. <laughs> She discovered something very recently in our condo. Now, we've lived here for three years already. And when we first moved in, we knew that the condo passed all the inspections. It passed the tests, including all the electrical sockets, which had been tested. And yet, there was one electrical socket, the top half of which didn't seem to function. We would plug something into it. Nothing would happen. We thought, well, maybe it's just a loose wire and it just kind of vibrated loose because of the television set on the wall. I didn't know. We were trying to figure out why it wouldn't work. I thought, I'll get to that later. <laughs> Three years later, I didn't get to that to find out why that wouldn't do, why that wouldn't work. And then we had two light switches. Couldn't figure out what they went to. Every other light switch in the house worked fine, but that one light switch near the Arcadia door, the sliding glass door, just didn't work. It's the one in the middle. I thought maybe they used to have something out here and it got taken away before we moved in. I don't know. There was another light switch like that that I thought might have gone to the, the electrical outlet below a table, thinking that if somebody wanted a lamp on that table, you could use that switch. We tried plugging something into that. Nothing. All of a sudden, 
for some reason, Callie decided to hit a light switch. I don't know if it was a mistake. She was going for one. She says, yes, it was a mistake. But she hit the light switch. And for some reason, we had plugged one of the electrical lamps into the top half, the one that was previously not working before. And so it was plugged into that one. When she hit that switch from across the room, voila. She, it was backwards. She hit it and it knocked it off. So it turned the light off. And that's when the light bulb went on over her head because the light bulb went off across the room. She discovered that that light switch from way across the room went to only one half of that electrical outlet. And we thought, why in the world would somebody do that? Well, we found out why. Now that we've lived with that that way for a while, when we're starting to go upstairs at night, we leave the kitchen, there's a switch right next to the kitchen light switch. Aha, that was one of the two that we didn't know what it went, went to. It goes to that switch. It's a double pole light switch that goes all the way across the room. So instead of having to spend six whole steps, which would just wear us out, <laughs> We get to just hit that one switch along with the kitchen switch. The lamp goes off, the kitchen goes off, boom, no big deal. Same thing coming down the stairs. It's the one next to the sliding glass doors that if you want it to go on, flip that switch, the light comes on across the room, voila. So now we understand that. It's like that with the Bible a lot, I've discovered. There are things that I've lived with sometimes for years, and I've read them, but I still don't quite get the full purpose behind it. Many of the things in the scriptures come across as being rather negative, and they seem like they're the cautionary tale style of teaching. Until you understand when you hit one switch that goes on and the light bulb goes on above, above your head and you go, <laughs> now I get it. Now I understand. Since God designed it this way, there was a reason for that. And it works great when you're following God's design. Everything functions the way it's supposed to, and it makes life so much easier. Well, that's what happens, I think, as we start to look at sex in the kingdom, because we understand his design first, then the cautionary tales start to make a little more sense as well. So Paul's advice, it's not just do's and don'ts. You should avoid this because it's bad or it's wrong, because that can send the wrong message, and we'll understand why. Here's a brief outline about what we're trying to accomplish today. It's rather intense, and there's a lot to, to cram into this whole study. So that's why I'm doing a lot of capsulization, and I'm choosing not to read both chapters six and seven. It would just take too long. Please do that, though, in the privacy of your own home. I urge you to read 1 Corinthians chapter six and seven, and do so in at least two translations. I think that will help you a bit. I prefer the NIV to start with, and then something a little more modern like the New Living Translation, because you can start to see some comparisons and contrasts, and the flow in the more contemporary version tends to make sense. Plus, you get a little doubling up, because the more you read something, the more it tends to sink in. So that's my homework assignment to you, who are the extra credit folks, and you love to do that. Read six and seven, both those chapters, uh, next chance you get. Okay, sex and its relationship to the kingdom of God. That's our first general topic. Sex and the culture, we'll be looking at predominantly the culture in Corinth, but we'll start to see how much there are some mirror images of what we're seeing today in American culture. And then thirdly, marriage and Paul's practical advice. That's gonna be a real brief bullet statement summary at the very end, which comes mostly from chapter seven. Sex and the kingdom, let's look at that first. The kingdom is the world restored. Every time you read, even in the New Testament, about Jesus introducing this kingdom, I spoke about that briefly yesterday at Chloe and Aaron's wedding, because they really like uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. That's Jesus Christ kind of outlining the constitution for this kingdom. It's the kingdom of the world restored. So he's talking about a future event as though it has already happened. And that's what it exactly is supposed to happen with us as believers. The purpose for everything in the kingdom, including sex within marriage, is to build unity and community so it's going to look exactly like it's going to look when God consummates the marriage of his church, the bride, with himself. Everything's going to be sinless. There will be no self involved to mar the image because it was created perfectly. It's going to be recreated perfectly. We're living in the betwixt and between right now where things get a little bit befuddled and mixed up. 
salvation. This is something important to us. Salvation for many, especially if they were growing up in an evangelical church, starts to sound like it's something that just removes us from this world, which is not our home. There's even some songs about that. This world is not my home. Well, it's not, and we understand that, but we're not supposed to simply cloister ourselves away from the world. We're supposed to engage the world as salt and light. So we're supposed to live in the world, but not become like the world. Salvation actually brings God's will to earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's present tense, as we see in the Lord's Prayer. There's something important for us to understand about 1 Corinthians 6 and 7, and that's the word inheritance that's used. Now, there may be some, if you look at some crazy movies today, where there would be some stipulations in somebody's last will and testament, whereby they would say, if you do these particular things which are wrong, you will get written out of the will. You're not going to inherit this money. Or if you don't do certain things, you're required to do certain things. In a sense, they're turning it into an earning. You have to earn this inheritance. But that's not really what the word inheritance is all about. It's really not about earning. You can't earn an inheritance. Uh, my mother and father worked very diligently for years, for decades, to set some money aside. And there was enough money left over after both of them went to heaven that we had a will. And my sister and I split that inheritance and it helped a great deal. But we didn't earn that. What's the, the basis of an inheritance? This is where it starts to get good. It's a relationship. Simply because they loved us because we were their beloved children, they gave us that inheritance. Same thing is true in the kingdom. And that's important as we look at sex in the kingdom and as we look at salvation, which doesn't take us away from the earth, but it brings actually heaven to earth. Because this basis of an inheritance is the relationship between a believer and God who loves us and gives us the right to become children of God as we appropriate that grace, which is freely given to us. That's the basis. It's free. Now, here's where it gets important for 1 Corinthians 6 and 7. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, which is a whole list of kinds of things, has been used, unfortunately, I think, for a myriad number of moralistic sermons. And almost all the time they're used to say, these are wrong, and these will exclude you from getting into heaven. That's the way it comes across. And I understand that. I get it. If you read it at face value, it sounds like that these are do's and don'ts, and if you do them, you don't get in. That's not what Paul is talking about here, however. We need to get behind that to a philosophy, which is really the theology based on God's kingdom, so that you understand more about what God's design is about, because then you see the beauty of it rather than only seeing the cautionary tale. So let's get a clearer understanding of Paul's intent. Paul's list in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. It's not intended to simply become a blacklist of qualifications that make you fail the entrance exam, so to speak, to get into heaven. The reason we need to make sure that that doesn't become this list of don'ts is because that way you start to turn it into a works-oriented salvation. Ah, you see the light bulb going on? If you do certain things, you do get in, and if you don't do these things, you can get in, but if you do these things in 9 through 11, boom, you're immediately excluded. See, that's, that's starting to take us in a new direction, which is works-oriented salvation, and that's not going to help this situation at all, because that's not how we obtain our salvation. We can't work for it. There's nothing we can do in our own strength to earn our salvation. Can I get an amen on the other end of the screen? Thank you. Now, what it's not. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. This list actually reveals the underlying attitude toward power, money, sex, and relationships. And that attitude goes much broader than just this list, but this is a pretty good cohesive list. And it shows us that it's not just talking about sex. There's power, there's money, there's sex, there are relationships. There's a pervasive attitude about people because they don't understand God's purpose for this new, remade, restored, perfect world which is filled with God's presence and is completely sinless. Paul's list reveals the kinds of behaviors that result from an attitude that can have no place in the welfare for everyone in this restored, redeemed, inherited kingdom. 
So he's really after getting to the attitude. This is far deeper than most people tend to look at when they're looking at that list in 1 Corinthians 6. God's kingdom. He's preparing his children for a sinless world where power, money, sex, and relationships are used in ways that will build unity and develop community. That's so vital. You need to think of those two words, and they're easier to remember because they have that same thing at the end, unity, community. That's the positive end of God's design for his kingdom. That's what we're aiming at. Power is used not for our own self-aggrandizement. Money is not used just for uh, prestige or to get the biggest and newest car or the biggest and newest house or the flashiest ring or the greatest watch to show that we have such power and prestige and money. Sex is not simply recreational. It's not just for building me up and getting what I want so I can scratch an itch. It's actually for something beautiful and lasting. And relationships are not just so that I can step on people to get up to where I need to go. It's not about building me up. It's about building unity among the people of God and a cohesive community. That's a part of the design. And the kingdom starts now. Becoming God's child is not about escaping to heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is. That's present tense, as it already is in heaven. So that starts while we're here on earth, which is why Paul is starting to show some of you were like that, he says in 1 Corinthians 6. Some of you used to belong to some of these categories, and yet you're not that anymore because God is transferring all of these attitudes. He's completely remaking your mind as you're putting on the mind of Christ. And so there's a big conversion taking place. And this kind of thing happens over a lifetime. It's not something that you can flip a switch, like that switch in our condo, and suddenly the light goes on. For many of us, it's going to be a long process. Sanctification takes a long time. And some of us are going to slip back into habits that we didn't want to slip back into, and we fail, and we feel terrible, and there's guilt, and there's shame, but God forgives us. He lifts us back up again. He points us on the right road, and we're back on it, and we're aiming at looking what's going to be perfect when we finally do see him face to face. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven means that we're in that process right now. And that's why Paul can say to these folks, some of you were like that, but you're not like that anymore. So you don't have to keep reverting back into that lifestyle. Keep looking ahead and allow God to continue to just completely remake you into a new creation in Christ Jesus. The way we're living now will point people to the completed restoration project. Every time somebody sees that change in us, it's going to create uh, a question mark in their mind. They're going to be thinking, why are they so different? And what is it about them that seems pleasant and seems attractive? I like this difference. I know that it's, I know they're different, but I kind of like it. What's going on? That's where 1 Peter 3.15 comes in. We should have a ready response to that to be able to tell them it's because Jesus is in my life and I'm becoming more like him. I'm not perfect yet, but I need him in my life and he is completely remaking me. Now, there's a very strong modern reaction, which I know you're aware of. Our current culture really reacts strongly and negatively to the words in Paul's list, especially the words that have to do with sex. Anytime we start bringing up the words homosexuality or adultery or fornication, boom, we're going to blow this conversation right out of the water because people have very strong reactions. Those are kind of trigger words or red flag words, hot button words. I want us to pull back a little bit on a broader look at that list. And let me show you a couple of things. First of all, have you, have you heard any good sermons lately about greed? I can't remember that there was any one time when I actually really assigned one specific sermon topic to greed and said, thou shalt not be greedy. But that's a part of the list. So as we start to understand this attitude that Paul is getting to, we need to understand that there are things that are just as bad, if we're going to use the cautionary tale version of this instruction, as homosexuality or fornication or any kind of sexual immorality. And by defining that, we're saying anything that's outside God's boundary of marriage, which is between a man and a woman, which we see in the book of Genesis. So there are materialists, people who are greedy. They want more, and they feed their own appetites. And Paul says, that's wrong. There's an attitude that's self-focused and which tramples on other people and other people's rights if they're greedy. 
that's included in the list. Slanderers, same thing. You know what a slanderer is? It's a gossip. If somebody can slander somebody else behind their back and kill their reputation, you think that's going to build up unity and community? I don't either. I think that slanderers are dangerous because they're trying to build themselves up by tearing other people down, and that destroys unity and it destroys community. Same thing with swindlers, which he has there. Now, I haven't seen any sermons on greed, slander, and swindles. And we're not talking about just people who cheat somebody once in a while or somebody gives them too much change and they just put it in their pocket and walk away. We're talking about people who destroy other people's lives through ruthless business practices. These would be like the kind of people that would say, uh, you Pharisees and you people use loopholes because you're devouring widows' houses meaning that you could foreclose on somebody's property when you clearly could have offered grace and helped somebody get through a difficult time rather than foreclosing on them. Ruthless business practices. That's not building unity and community. It's doing what you can do to get the most for yourself. That's the attitude. If we start to, if we start to add all of these things in along with the areas which relate to sex, we start to see that there's a self focused attitude, which is at the key of this specific list. I hope you're starting to see that we're getting to something important here so that we're not just making it a whole list of don'ts. So why would Paul lump those qualities in with homosexuals and adulterers in that list? All of these qualities elevate the individual over community. They destroy unity and community. So when someone habitually engages in sex outside God's design for marriage, which is one man, one woman for life, we get that because of some beautiful phrases in Genesis as we start to see that a couple of words for that kind of unity actually means face to face. And it's like a puzzle image so that they fit perfectly together because woman was made even out of a part of man. There's a poetic beauty to that design that God has for us. Every time somebody habitually engages in sex outside that design, they're focusing on selfish desires to meet their own needs, and their actions begin to break down, and ultimately, if they continue, it will destroy unity and the kind of community that God has in mind for this restored world. God's design is to create lifelong relationships resulting in unified communities. That's why every time any minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ performs a wedding, they say, till death do us part, or something like that, as a part of the vows. God's design is for one man and one woman to be together for the rest of their lives, and Paul will even show us in chapter 7 that only death can end that. He says a little something that's a caveat that has to do with an unbeliever who, if they choose to leave a believer, the believer, understandably, would need to start thinking about another uh, life after that. You can read that in chapter seven. It gets a little bit tricky with some of those details. The main thing though is that Paul is saying marriage is for life. Try to live as a married person, as a believer in whatever circumstances you're put in and keep doing whatever you can do for life. I would put one caveat into that real quickly here and insert that if there is any kind of abuse going on, you need to separate from that abuse. So I'm not, I don't want to be one of those preachers that somebody could misinterpret as saying, uh, if there's somebody being abused, you have to stay in that. No, no, no. Get out of that situation, even if it's just a, a restraining order or to go to somewhere safe. I want to make sure that that's clear. Jesus protected people from abuse as well. Therefore, God's design, when you look at the real reason for it, you look at the long-term goal, it's a beautiful and attractive design. Who wouldn't want a monogamous relationship that would last through a lifetime and that has as its reward the kind of intimacy that grows into such depth that it's just indescribable. I would want that. I would think that everybody, if they start to hear it described that way, would say, yeah, that's a really nice desire. It's not biblical, therefore, to treat sex as being dirty or bad since God designed it to be rewarding and beautiful in its proper context. We're going to see in just a little bit why there were two competing ideologies that Paul was addressing in this one letter, and one was at the opposite end of the other. One said that sex was great, get as much as you can all the time, because they didn't see anything wrong with that. Others were saying, oh, no, no, it's bad. 
the body is bad, it's sinful. So anything that you do that's pleasurable should be completely wiped out. Last week we saw that phrase, food for the stomach, the stomach for food. And we mentioned that that meant, let's feed all of our appetites. That was the Greek mindset. Paul was quoting something that was a slogan to them, which they used not just about eating and gluttony, but every type of ap appetite, which is why there was an awful lot of sexual immorality going on in Paul's day in Corinth, especially because of the Greek culture. You can even look at uh, the Temple of Aphrodite. There were some things going on there that would have temple worship that would even include orgies because they thought that was a part of their worship practice. Clearly with that as a part of his milieu, Paul would be saying, don't do that. That's just terrible. You're missing the point because it takes us so far away from God's design for what's going to be unity and community because you've missed the boat. Plus, you're not supposed to be bringing in paganism to your Christian worship. That was a capsulization from last week. This no limits approach had to do with the dichotomy of the body and spirit when they would say, well, the body is nothing. It's going to die and be gone anyway. And so Whatever the appetite we have for that body is given to us for this life and this life only, but our soul is what lives on. So go ahead and do whatever you want to with the body. They missed that point that we're actually a holistic unit, mind, body, and spirit, and that God has all those, and they're all interconnected. And Paul knew that we were interconnected that way. Well, this week we get to see, especially starting in the very first verse of chapter seven, that there was another group that existed back then. And in this group, was at the opposite end of that spectrum. It says, now for the matters you wrote about, and I italicized you to mention that Paul was addressing the matter that they had sent him information about. And he doesn't say, let me address the matters you wrote about by saying that it's good for a man not to have sexual relationships with a woman. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, this is the matter you wrote about. That was their matter. They were saying, it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Abstinence is what Paul was dealing with here because there was another group of people probably influenced by people like the aesthetics or the Essenes. There was a group of people called the Essenes that lived, some of them around Qumran where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Joy and I were there a couple of years ago and we actually got to read some of the documents that were written by the people who were really like monks and they would spend all day long seeking to be as spiritual as they could. They believed in ritual cleansings and so they had uh, these baptistries, and they would have immersion baptism every day of their lives. Some think that John the Baptist may have come from that Essene uh, subculture, which were similar to Pharisees and Sadducees in some ways, slightly fewer numbers than the Pharisees and Sadducees, but there were quite a number of the Essenes back then. And one of their philosophies was we should actually abstain from physical pleasure of all kinds. Anything pleasurable to the senses was bad. That would be like the Puritans moving to America and saying it's hard to, to enjoy a good meal because you might actually enjoy it. So they would probably want to make it as bland as possible. And I think, man, I'm so glad that the New Testament gives us freedom to eat guacamole with garlic and lime and salt and all those good things. Can I get an amen out there? Amen. That's right. The Essenes spent their time copying scriptures and trying to attain super spiritual lifestyle without physical pleasures. I doubt that they would have enjoyed Mexican food. Not sure they would have had Mexican food. Beside the point, I'm getting off script. Please forgive me. Two views, both of which existed in what was then the modern church for Paul. And of course, this is a brand new thing because this is the first century. It's just a few years after Jesus Christ died, was buried, rose again on the third day. The church is just now starting to grow and develop. And both of these views existed. It would be almost like having an Amish subculture with Living Water Community Church, all in the same church, trying to find some balance in how we're supposed to be worshiping together. Really wide extremes here. Group one, sex is no big deal. Greek culture, the Hellenists. It's like eating. Hey, if, it's, if it tastes good, Eat it. If you want more guacamole, just keep doing that. If you want to just keep eating another cake, let's eat three tonight. No big deal. And the same thing with any other appetite, whatever that physical appetite might be. Group two, from the Essenes and the aesthetics, sex is a big deal. Our bodies are sinful and they're awful and we should do everything to suppress those appetites, avoid sensual pleasure at all costs. Both of those existed in Corinth. Talk about a challenge almost as challenging as the maskers, no maskers. Wait, oh, I got off script again. Please forgive me. Paul presents God's design. 
He quotes from Genesis, and there is where it gets beautiful. A man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Interesting word for the word flesh the second time he uses that there. He doesn't use the same basic word twice. He's not doing a parallel, which is exactly the same. Otherwise, we would get two people are joined together, and they become joined together. It's not what he's saying. There's a beautiful word that he's using here. Two people are joined together, and as they do so, they become radically different as one. One something transcendent, something that's a part of uh, the old German word gestalt. It becomes so much better in union than it would be by their individual parts. There's something that happens there that's almost like a chemical reaction. They're both the same individual, and yet they're together different and better. What is NACL? I gave you a little bit of a question there, part of which was my searching for a good illustration, and you provided one. Thank you for that. I appreciate the fact that you chemistry folks out there provided this. What is NACL? Well, sodium plus chloride, salt. And it provides salt crystals, and if, as we know, we're supposed to be salt and light, so there's a lot of good analogies there. But I'm looking at it from the chemistry pers perspective here. There are two elements, sodium and chloride. And if you add those things together, yeah, they're still the two elements, but something happens that's wonderful because it turns out to, to have a wonderful effect for everybody. True story, Joy and I had not married yet. In fact, we barely knew each other, but we went to a church. Uh, I was actually on staff there as a part-time minister of music way back in college. And June Ramsey was a real hoot. She was a wonderful lady, had a, a, a wonderful sense of humor, a great laugh. Uh, a strong biblical scholar. She was a Sunday school teacher, like so many of you scholarly, biblical, uh, strong teachers that we've got in our midst. But she had a daughter who was very much like June. She was kind of a chip off the old block, very precocious. And when Joy and I walked into West Thomas Baptist Church one evening for Sunday night service, this little girl who was very young looked up at us, and she must have had the gift of prophecy because she said, oh, you two are gonna get married. <laughs> and I looked at Joy and Joy looked at me and we had never mentioned that to each other. But apparently, June's daughter must have noticed something about the way I looked at Joy and the way Joy looked at me. And you know what? <laughs> she was right. Something about the chemistry that happened there. And Paul understands that there is a chemistry that happens when God's design is carried out. And there's a balance based on God's design to help us understand that we shouldn't cheapen God's design for sex. We shouldn't treat it like it's just some uh, recreational activity. We shouldn't do it so that there's self-aggrandizement going on, that I want what I want because if you're not fulfilling that for me, then you're bad and it's all about me. And we shouldn't avoid God's design for sex either. We shouldn't treat that as though it's something to be avoided because it's bad or wrong. If we understand God's original design, we understand that it's a beautiful thing and that there's a chemistry happening there. So that's our starting point is God's design. Emotional intimacy, intimacy first, and then comes the physical intimacy. We've completely reversed the two. We've gotten us so backwards now. And that's why I think so many couples will move in together. They don't get married first. They cohabit. They're just cohabitating together. They're trying to fix their problems by having more sex. And really all that does is just make things worse. And then because they've had sex, they actually stay in a relationship way too long when they really should have broken up a long time before that. Because there's a, an intimacy that starts to, to develop around that because you've given so much of yourself that you feel like you can't just walk away from that. We've reversed it. And there's so many negative consequences to reversing God's original design. That's the cautionary tale part of this two-sided coin. And we need to understand that. There will be serious consequences for reversing God's starting point. The starting point is emotional intimacy first. I've got to say, I've kind of become a fan of long distance relationships. It happened a long time ago because of World War II. Somebody would start to fall in love 
They might have gotten married, or if they hadn't gotten married, they were actually courting by mail, long distance, as this soldier would be deployed, he'd go off to some foreign country. We've got the same thing happening now because of the internet. Not necessarily because of deployments, although it still happens, but we've got people who are in different states and they're getting to know each other, but they're developing emotional intimacy first. And then they start to bring that together by saying, we know each other well enough to know that the physical will take care of itself. But that's really beside the point. The physical intimacy is really kind of the icing on the cake, so to speak, but the real intimacy is what happens when we're becoming true friends and we know all about each other. Knowing and being fully known, that's what God has for us. And he is the model for us, even through the Trinity, which I've mentioned before. You know somebody, even their faults, and you love them anyway. That's what God does to us. That's what we can do for each other in a marriage. And our culture has reversed the two. So, this is something you don't hear very often in sermons. You want a great sex life? The highest levels of satisfaction in surveys, and I purposefully looked for more contemporary surveys, surveys than the ones that I was quoting back when I was a part of a marriages that work committee in a different county. And I wanted to get secular surveys. I wanted it not to be skewed uh, because, you know, it depends on who's doing the survey about how these reports may come out. So I wanted a secular company doing the survey. I looked for several things, and it really validated what we were seeing 30, 40 years ago. The same is true today. The highest levels of satisfaction are revealed in surveys. 2017 survey in 28 different European countries, thousands of people surveyed. 82% of these people surveyed, 82% were married and monogamous couples that said they had great sex lives. Married and monogamous. You think that says something? You think that's telling? Now, cohabiting couples had much lower. There were some that were down around 30, 40% saying that they, they had a good sex life. Many of those, if you were to track them, are probably still in the infa infatuation stage. Because what we really find out in through these surveys is that because people are cohabiting, they have a greater opportunity for breakup than people who are married. And once they've done that, they have a greater opportunity for repeat breakups. And so what you see is you've got people who are acting like they're married, but they're not married, and they're breaking up again and again and again. So they don't have 20 years of experience in being together. They have two years repeated 10 times. And it's not doing a good job for building long-lasting relationships. And I'm saying this because I care about you enough to want you to get the very best of what God designs us to be like. I want you to have the great marriages and great sex lives within those marriages based on God's design for you, which is gonna last forever. And that's what I'm trying to present to you. 96% of those surveyed in a different secular survey said that, quote, being connected emotionally through vulnerability resulted in the best sex. You see how that mirrors what I've been trying to say from God's design for marriage? If you want the most rewarding relationship, choose God's design. It communicates, I belong exclusively to you. And that's where people feel safe with each other. You become your, each other's safe place. And that's where the emotional intimacy breaks down the walls, breaks down the barriers. And then you can celebrate by renewing your vows, so to speak, with sex in marriage, which has been likened by some theologians to communion. And I can see the parallels there. Sex within marriage is a renewal of the covenant relationship that you made when you stood before God and witnesses and said, I will leave all others and keep myself only unto you. It's a reminder of your original vows, and it's a beautiful thing when it grows out of emotional intimacy. There's a mirage analogy, not marriage analogy, but a mirage analogy, that those who try to seek after pleasure or they're seeking gratification physically without first seeking emotional intimacy is like chasing a mirage. The closer you get, the farther away it seems. You can't quite catch up to it. And that would be any kind of sex outside of God's design. So just describe it however you want to describe it. Any kind of sex outside the design that God has for marriage, which is between one man, one woman for life, and it's gonna be like chasing after a mirage. It needs to be soul to soul first. And then it becomes skin to skin. Our culture has completely reversed it. And so had many of the people in Corinth that Paul was writing to. Here's a summary of 1 Corinthians 7. I'm just going to bust right through these real quickly. 
Married people should not withhold themselves from one another because you don't belong to yourself. You belong to each other. So do what's best for the other, not just for yourself. Think more highly of the other person in your relationship than you do yourself. If both people in that marriage are doing that for one another, it's going to be a beautiful thing. He goes into a little time to say, if you need to have some separation for a time, that's fine, but don't do it too long because you might tempt yourselves to do something that goes outside of God's design. And so make sure that you're spending that time praying and growing closer together in emotional intimacy. It's what he's inferring and then come back together again. So don't deprive yourselves. Also, if you're single, it's okay to remain single. Paul himself uh, clearly was single by some of the things he said in this chapter. There were times when he would say, I would like that you would all be like me. But Paul was a very unique individual, and he had a lot of work to do for the kingdom. It probably would not have been a good thing for him to be married. I can't imagine what his wife would have been like, dealing with everything that Paul did, traveling as much as he traveled, being stoned at times with real rocks, uh, having a snake bite, being shipwrecked. I mean, it, it would not have been a, a comfortable place for a wife in that situation. I've known other missionaries who are single, and probably it's a good thing because they're in situations very much like the Apostle Paul, where being married would be very difficult for a wife. But even though marriage is difficult, that's true, he almost reverses that, because even in verse 9 he says, but if you're unmarried and need an appropriate relationship, because you have these passions, that's okay, get married. And he's inferring there, because marriage is wonderful. So both are okay. If you're going to remain single, remain single, and dedicate yourself to God's work, and try to remain pure. And if you've blown it, get forgiveness, get back on track again. That's the overarching theme of this because he's talking to people who have gotten off track and he's bringing them back on track again. Marriage is for life. Do everything you can to remain committed to your spouse. Now, you can read more details in these passages through the remainder of 1 Corinthians 7. I don't have time to go into all those details. He's getting a little bit more nitpicky about certain specific situations. But the overriding thing is, whatever situation you're in, try to remain in that marriage as far as is humanly possible. In short, live as a believer in whatever circumstance you find yourself in. And he's saying that if a wife is the believer and a husband is an unbeliever, live in such a way that you're going to have a positive influence on that unbelieving husband. And I'm sure that the reverse would also be true. And here's a foreshadowing. This is what we heard in that, especially the last song in our pre-service music today. Intimacy is marriage, or intimacy in marriage is a foreshadowing. It's a picture of what we're going to see fleshed out for real in that satisfying unity and community that God's children are going to experience when we finally get to meet him. Because we are the bride. Those of us who are believers in Christ are the bride. No mind, no human mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. We can't even comprehend how good it's going to be. We can only get little tiny glimpses of it. And I'm here to tell you, and I don't mean this to be crass. I think it's a beautiful thing. Those of you who are married, if you have experienced what I've been talking about through scripture, so that you've known emotional intimacy that resulted in that great, wonderful reward, which is amazing sex, that's a foreshadowing. And you think, nothing could be better than that. It can. There will be something even greater than that to look forward to because no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Single people, if you're wondering, will I miss that for the rest of this life? Possibly. I've known some people who remain single their entire lives, like the Apostle Paul. But you know what? You're not going to miss out in heaven. Because if there's something that's so much better than that, you get to experience that as well. Something incredible for us to know that God loves us so much that he wants to give us that which will last forever, and it will be the greatest satisfaction that anybody can imagine. He has that for all who are believers and who trust him. So here's a question that many may ask, and it's a valid question. If sex is such an important part of my life, why would God ask me to give that up? Let's say you're in a relationship and you realize, ooh, that's outside. It falls outside this boundary that the pastor has just described for me. Why would God ask me to give up something that's that important? A couple of reasons why I think that might be true. First of all, Jesus' own parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. 
In his excitement, he hit it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy that field. All of us are going to be giving up something to follow Jesus. All of us. For everyone, no matter what it is, no matter what it is we give up, it's worth it. You should be willing to give up everything for the sake of that which is going to last forever and which no mind has even imagined how good it's going to be. I knew one pastor, a friend of mine, uh, I sang in a quartet with these four guys, and two of the guys in the quartet lived in the same family. They were brothers. Their dad was a pastor. His wife had some physical ailments. Uh, she had several different physical ailments, some of which just created so much pain. She had arthritis that it just racked her with pain to even walk. They couldn't have sex. That meant for decades they couldn't have sex. She was stricken with uh, some of those ailments after she had already given birth to two sons. And so the, clearly they had a good sex life, which led to two sons, and that was wonderful. But that man clearly had to live without sex with his wife for decades. And he was one of the most joyful, fulfilled people I've ever met in my life. And he was celibate. There are many reasons why somebody might need to give something up. It may come in the form of sex. It may come in the form of God asking you to give up something that you enjoy. Uh, I knew a person who was a wonderful musician. They felt in order to be effective on a certain mission field before they went there that they had to sell every one of their musical instruments. They didn't want anything to get in the way of what God had for them in this specific mission field that they were being called to. That was a lot for them to give up. It was like giving up something that was at the core of who they were as human beings. So I would say that whatever it is, whether it's sex or a piano or anything else that you might have to give up, if it's at your core, God will replace that core with Jesus Christ at your core. And Jesus is enough. And as we start to get to know him, when we start to live for the design God has for all of us, he will give us such amazing things in return for that. Maybe not immediately. Some may still struggle with some of the temptations that come. Some may say, what about a genetic predisposition? Some will really have to struggle with that. Some may, may fall back into sin in ways that are different than others. But if we live according to God's design, God will forgive us every time we've blown it. Because here's the deal. Remember how Paul had said in chapter 6 that even if a man, this was kind of a crass uh, illustration on his part, I felt, in our culture, but in their culture, it was a very real thing. He said, if a man is united with a prostitute, the two become one. Think about that. If we're the bride of Christ, and if we're having sex with somebody outside of God's design, in a sense, we're bringing Christ into that union. And yet, because of Christ on the cross, he has forgiven that. There's nothing that you may have done, even if you feel that you've really blown it at some part, at some part in your life, at some point. No matter what you've done, God can forgive that. If you will confess it as sin, and repent and say, God, I want to live for you. I want that design. I'm willing to step outside of what I felt was comfortable. I realize now that it was outside your design. I want your design. I'm willing to place myself under your care and under your authority. I want your protection. So I want to live within your boundaries. Please help me to do that. And he'll do that. He'll allow you to live in such a way. If you have struggled in any way, with sexual purity in whatever form. Uh, I want to recommend some really good outside reading. This guy is actually in heaven now. Uh, he was born in Liverpool, England, uh, raised in Manchester. He moved to Canada. He was in Manitoba for a long time. An interesting fella. He had quite a unique uh, skill set or skill sets, plural, because not only was he a psychiatrist, a physician, but he was also a medical doctor for a while and on the mission field. So he was in medical missions and he was a church planter in Canada. Very unusual guy, a lot of talents, a lot of spiritual giftedness. And he wrote not only because of the biblical perspective, which he had, which is very strong, but because he understood some of the mental health and psych, uh, psychiatric profiles of different people that might lend a difference in the way they approach this subject. He has some good things for a lot of people in these two books, Eros Defiled and Eros Redeemed. I looked to see if they're still in print. They are. You can get them through Amazon. I'm sure some others too. 
but I highly recommend them. I think it would give you a biblical perspective along with some mental health um, perspective as well. And now the final word on sexual sin. It's the final word that's gonna allow all of us to become part of that remade, restored world that God has for everybody who is God's child, and that is forgiveness. That's the gospel. When it comes to sex, forgiveness is available to everybody. To the person who has sinned because they've sat in front of a computer and they've been tempted to go into a place that they should not have gone, there is forgiveness for you. For somebody who's gotten into a premature relationship with somebody and you've started acting as though you're married by putting skin to skin before soul to soul, there's forgiveness for you. For somebody who's gotten into a same-sex relationship and yet you felt that tug at your spirit by the Holy Spirit and you think, as solid as I feel this relationship is, there's still something in my spirit that tells me it's wrong. I want God's design for me and as difficult as it's going to be, there's forgiveness for you. And you can repent and walk away from that. And I know it's gonna be difficult and my heart breaks for the ache that will be experienced by people because it's a dying to self in every one of these instances. It's a dying to self every time we have to walk away from something that has become, in a sense, controlling us or an addiction. And yet there is forgiveness because there is the gospel. And once we have gotten that forgiveness, the final act in forgiveness is to forgive ourselves. That's often the most difficult. And yet it's available to every single one of us because there's nothing that any of us could have done or could do that's any greater than God's grace and his forgiveness. He offers that so freely and he offers it to you. And I'd like to pray so that we can appropriate that forgiveness right now. And if you'd like to appropriate that forgiveness, let's make this your prayer and you can pray it silently. Or if you're by yourself and you want to pray it out loud, you can because I can't hear you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I'm praying right now for forgiveness for myself because I know that I have strayed in areas according to what Paul was talking about related to an attitude that's self-centered. And while my sin may not look like somebody else's sin, I'm sure that I fall into one of those categories in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that has disrupted unity or destroyed unity and has failed to build up community. I know that I failed because all sin is sin. And we've tended to build up one sin over another in ways that are unhealthy. And we need to understand that all sin is sinful. And so I pray for your forgiveness for me, understanding that I too am a sinner saved by grace. Thank you for that forgiveness. Father, for everybody else who's out there, whatever that sin might be that they may have been struggling with, Right now, in this moment, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just fill their lives with a sense of your forgiveness. Help them to feel right now your presence in a tangible way, knowing from head to toe that they're being flooded with forgiveness by you because you love them and you'll forgive anything that they may have done. And I pray that as they are wrestling with something, that you'll continue to wrestle with them because you, since you gave up, everything to become like us as a human being, that Jesus Christ was our wonderful Lord and Savior who has experienced every temptation known to man. You can feel what we feel. You understand it, even though you overcame all sin. But you do understand it. And because of that, I pray that they will sense that you're with them in their struggle and that you're helping them get out of that struggle by finding freedom through repentance. And I pray that you'll do that. And I know that you can, and I know that you will, because you're that kind of a God who desires to build a community of believers so that we can have that wonderful, eternal intimacy once and for all. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.